Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I want to welcome everybody to my fourth Tuesday Revolutionize Your Retirement interview with expert series. I'm Dory Mincer, owner of Revolutionize Retirement and your host. Today, we're going to be focusing on the paradox of aging. And my guest, John Leland, let me tell you a little about him. He is a reporter at the New York Times, and he wrote a year-long series where he followed six people age 85 and over, and that became the basis for his book, which is Happiness is a Choice You Make, Lessons from a Year Among the Oldest Old, and it's a New York Times bestseller. Before joining the Times in 2000, he was a senior editor at Newsweek and editor-in-chief of Details magazine. I actually had been aware of the articles in the Times and then went and heard John speak when he was in Brookline, Mass., and then have read his book actually a few times and actually listened to it. And I have to say, when you listen to it, at the end of listening, you get the real wonderful opportunity to hear the voices of of the people that he's talking about. So it's kind of special to be able to, to listen to it, too, although I also have the book and it's great to read. So I want to just get started right now. And so, John, maybe tell us, how did this book begin? What got you interested in doing this? As you mentioned, it began with a series in the New York Times, where I'm a reporter in the Metro section, and my editor had been asking me about doing something off the census, the 2010 census, and as I looked at it, the number that jumped out at me was the growth in this 85-plus population, that when I was born, there were fewer than a million, and now there's a little more than six million. So it's like, imagine if like there were suddenly six times as many teenagers running around. So I felt that this was a population that that are there, they're growing so quickly, but we don't really know much about them. And what we do know about them comes from people who have never been old, right? And it's as if like everything we ever read about Italian food came from people who had never tasted it. So I spent a year following these six people for the for the paper and writing about their lives. And I thought I would get one thing going in and I found I was completely surprised by them. And I ended the year in an entirely different direction than the one I set out in. So maybe tell us what did you expect when you got started, which which ended up being so different from what you discovered. Well, we all know what old age looks like, right? It's about misery and about breaking down in our bodies and our minds. And that's what I thought I was going to write about. I thought, well, okay, I, I picked these six people and maybe one's going to fall and break a hip and one's going to like start to lose their memory or they become socially isolated. And as I looked ahead, I saw like a whole series of malady of the month stories because that's how we write about aging. That's the story we know how to tell. And as I spent time with them, I realized that a lot of them had a lot of the problems that I was expecting, but none of them defined themselves by their problems. You know, only other people did that. Their kids defined them that way. Their doctors defined them that way. Maybe the people who ran the building that they lived in defined themselves by their pro- defined them by their problems. But none of them saw, saw themselves that way. And what they all had in common, as different as they all were from one another, is that they all managed to live for the things they could still do not for the things that they lost. And this made such a big impression on me because I know so many people of any age that they live for the things that they're missing in their lives or for the grievances that they have in their lives or the things that are bothering them in their life. And this can be very, very productive. It can get you things. If you want, if you, if you live for the problems, you might live to fix them, right? You might, that, that mm-hmm. might be the motivating force in your life. It can be useful, but it re- can also be really hard on you and your relationships with all the people around you. And I noticed that that's what I was doing. And so the series is my attempt to get at what 85 or 90 looks like to the people who are living it. And the book is really about what I learned about how to live a better life from these people who had lived long enough to know something about it. 
and as I said, it wasn't at all what I was expecting. And, and I, you know, as a newspaper reporter, I tend to be very objective and, and distant from my material. It has nothing to do with me. You know, it doesn't affect me. And mm-hmm. this series affected me like nothing I'd ever done before. And that really comes across in how well you wrote the book and, and some of what you say in it. It's almost like you started it with the kind of the ageist kind of myth and association to aging that so many of us have and came away with sort of an appreciation of the wisdom and perspective of people who are older, which is what we want I would, to try to help people see. I would say absolutely that I started it with those, those ageist myths. And not only that, but I wasn't aware of it. I didn't know, realize that they were ageist myths until I got into it and realized first that they were myths and then realized, oh, of course, we have them because they're they're ageist. But gosh, they are so prevalent. They just run deep into every every part of our society. Like my mother, who's 90, who turned 90 in mm-hmm. December, said to me in the middle of this project, don't you get depressed being around all those old people all the time? And I was far enough into it that it was the, that I had, I was already on the other side. I'm like, no, mom, this is like the most yeah. rewarding work that I've ever done. I thought mm-hmm. like you that it was going to be depressing, but, mm-hmm. but, uh, but it was the exact opposite. And it made me step back and say, why is our culture so bent on telling this one story about old age that it's about, you know, decline and misery and, right. and breakdown when in, in fact we know from, you know, year after year, study after study, older people say they're more content with their lives than younger people. Right. They're just more resilient. There's this, mm-hmm. they have experienced losses in their lives and survive them. And so mm-hmm. when they face the daily little losses that we all experience, they don't look at them as the end of the world. And also because they've experienced more loss over more years, they're able to appreciate some of the good things in life. And there's a number of different explanations for this. And and sociologists call it the paradox of aging. Mm -hmm. And it's so fascinating to me. I thought, oh, come on. That's Mm -hmm. a bunch of nonsense. That can't be true. People just aren't telling the truth. And then I've gone out there and I found, well, it was true of these very, very different six people that I spent time with. And not only that, but it's been almost two years since the book came out. And I've been speaking about it around the country at more than 100 talks. And everywhere I go, lots of people show up and they say, oh, that's me. Or, oh, that's my aunt, or that's my mother, or that's my neighbor who meant so much to me. And they get up in the morning and they're just giving thanks for another day instead of grumbling that things aren't perfect. Well, two things that came to my mind as you were saying that. One, I was thinking that everybody says old is 10 years older than they are. And so your mother being 90 saying, aren't you going to be depressed being around all those old people? (laughs) But it also reminded me that a a dear friend of mine who's in this book group I'm in, Jan um, Hively, who is 87, she said that when you say a year in the life of the oldest old and you're referring to the oldest old is 85, she said be careful, that's still a bit ageist. <laughs> so, she, so, so we need to be aware of that too, because, you know, 85, as you say, the fastest growing segment of the population, and there's some really active, vital, amazing people, you know, into 100 even now. So that was just a comment that I promised her I would make <laughs> make when you're on the call. So tell us about some of the people, and, and, and the, well, maybe start, how did your mother influence it, and because I know she she really does play an important role, I think, in it and sort of some of kind of your experience and some of how it influenced some of your interactions with her. Oh, gosh, I don't think I had a conversation with any of these people that I didn't either think about my mother or mention my mother. My mother's, as I said, she's 90. She's She gets around by an electric wheelchair these days. But she's she says, you know, if you want to know what old age is like? It stinks. That's mm-hmm. That's been her attitude uh, mm-hmm. throughout her life. But I think if you asked her what, does, what 54 is like, she would say it stinks too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sort of my mother's uh, temperament. Mm-hmm. I don't know that she's depressed. She's never been diagnosed that, but she's kind of a doer person. That's Some people have these 
to upbeat dispositions and some people have downbeat dispositions and my father was one way and my mother's the other way. So she was always a big influence on me and I always wondered why is it that some people have who have a lot of things going for them are kind of unhappy in their lives and other people who are are really challenged just to get through the day do so with with great joy and resilience. I, I met a man not too long ago. Well, actually, I met him over the phone, so I can't say we've met in person, but whose name is Lucky. And I was curious about that, and he said he became lucky when he had this brain aneurysm that keeps him in a wheelchair, and it made him rethink what was important in his life. And so that's why he goes through life feeling lucky. Because not because he survived the brain aneurysm, but because he's able to focus on the things that are important to him now instead of living the way he did before. So I, I always was curious as to why people work at one way or another. And that was one of the questions that I was going for in the time that I spent with the six people. As for the six people, they were just, they're all so different from one another. I hope we'll have a chance to discuss them all over the course of this hour. But maybe I'll just start with Howie start right and Helen. Now. Yeah. Please. Howie and Helen <laughs> were this couple who met in a nursing home in the Bronx and you know, they it was for Helen it was only the second love of her life. And for Howie I think it was really only the first. And I'd set out I wanted a, a couple who met late in life and had the nerve to the courage to fall in love and to really love each other. Mm-hmm. late in life, because I felt I didn't know that story. I sort of know, or I thought I knew, the story of the couple who's married for 70 years, and their their marriage gets stronger and more soulful, or, or, or goes the other way, they lose interest in each other. I thought I knew that one. But the people who had nursed a spouse through the painful late years of their life, and then have the courage to love somebody else, knowing that you can't do so for very long and that one of you will watch the other one, you know, start to decline. I thought that took a kind of courage that that I didn't understand. Mm-hmm. Helen Helen was like, she was loud and brassy and beautiful. And she was always in a fight with someone or other at the nursing home. And she said that she and Howie had never had an argument. And I thought that was so amazing. But she said... Well, because whatever I say goes, right, Howie? <laughs> so that was her explanation. But Howie had been in a brain, uh, in a car accident and had a, a, a brain injury that made him a lot slower than Helen. And I sometimes wondered, like, what it was that Helen was getting out of their relationship. And she explained it to me one day. She said, I take care of him. He's an only child. And he had nobody. And then when his mother and father died, he really had nobody except me. I try to be everything to him. I think that I am. And I was so, so moved by that because, you know, here was this 94-year-old woman wanting to be everything to another human being and feeling like she got there. You know, she couldn't do the things she used to do, but she could still be everything to Howie Zimmer. And that, that was just amazing to me. Yeah. Yeah, you describe their relationship, and it's, it's a, in a in a beautiful way the dynamics. But but you know, as you said before, it's sort of interesting because her her daughter. I mean, it was almost a competition. It seemed like with her daughter and Howie. Um, oh, a great three way love triangle. Right. You know, I, and I think it's not uncommon. The children no. are often jealous of their parents' new relationship because. You know, and I, the daughter knew that her time with her mother was limited, and it was really important to her, and it was hard for her to share that, I think. Yeah. Or it is hard for her to share that. Helen is still with us. Right. So tell, keep telling us, I mean, I, I really would love everybody to learn about these wonderful people that you interviewed, so just go in whatever order you'd like and maybe share. Uh, Jonas Meckes. Jonas is, was 92 when I met him. I believe. I think this is correct. And Jonas is an avant-garde filmmaker. One of the first times I spent time with Jonas, we went to a jazz club in Greenwich Village where he was doing a reading. And he's on stage, and Jonas is a Holocaust survivor. He'd he'd been a teenager in Lithuania. Stalin's Soviet troops came in, turned his life upside down. The next year, the Nazis come in, and Jonas ends up in a Nazi slave labor camp. 
not a death camp because he's not Jewish. And he's on stage and he says, have you ever thought about how amazing, really amazing life is? And that was Jonas's attitude towards everything. He just he just was filled with this incredible life force, and he just ran circles around me the entire time. And he surrounded himself with people with a lot of energy, and he said, I'm a vampire. I feed on their energy. And I think that the most important lesson that Jonas taught me was not to worry about things. And he said, I never worry. I'll start to worry when something happens. Why worry when it's not happening? And then why worry when it happens? You deal with it, you know, because almost all the things we worry about don't come true. And the things that we do, the things that do come true turn out to be much different from what we thought they were. So it was through Jonas I'm getting these lessons about, well, how how is it you get through your days? Mm-hmm. You know, Jonas was the creator of his own story. He was really conscious of that. And I think that was one of the strategies that that all the six had to one extent or another. The more they saw themselves as the authors of their own lives, Mm -hmm. the better shape they were in. And the less they saw themselves that way and thought like old age is just something that happens to you, they were the least satisfied. That is an important lesson. You know, being able to focus on what we can do. He, I remember, I think it was Jonas who had that wonderful expression about now at his age, what was it? He, he might not be able to go to the Himalayas, but the Himalayas are inside of him. Oh, yeah. He says, like, my Himalayas are now. My, my Himalayas yeah. are now. Yeah. Right here, yeah. right now. Right. So really focusing on the present and not dwelling on the past is what I hear, but but being informed. I mean, the story comes from the past, but it's it's the being positive about what I can do now is what I'm hearing. Right. We all live with that cliche. We're told to live in the moment, but right. who knows what it means? Right. And then when people started to see their time as finite, then living in the moment wasn't a cliche. It was... Mm-hmm. It was just a way of living, taught by, you know, people who had lived a while. So, I, you know, that was something that, you know, I'd always thought about that. Oh, live in the moment. What's that mm-hmm. like? Mm-hmm. I got to see it in, in people who, like Jonas, just felt like this day, this moment has everything I need of life in it right now. You know, later on, I'll need something else. But right now, this second, this is it. And to savor that, because you know it's not coming back. Right. It takes a while to come to that wisdom, maybe, but yeah. we're all capable of it. Well, it sounds like it turned your life around in some ways of just being able to just sort of appreciate what is, <laughs> as you talk oh, about gosh. in the book too. Yeah, yeah, that's the a big thing. Just distinguishing between what is and what isn't, living for what is. Not for what isn't, not that, that goal that's way out there in the distance, but just enjoying what's right in front of you right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you still, you still have your goals, you still shoot for them, but don't think that your life begins once you attain that goal. Your mm-hmm. life is your, is your striving for that goal. And it's a subtle difference, but a really, really meaningful one. Yeah, really important. So tell us about Fred. Oh, Fred. Fred's, <laughs> Fred's almost the funniest of them all. Almost my favorite. Everyone says, everyone has accused me of liking Fred the most. <laughs> but I love all my kids the same. Fred was, was 87 when I met him, living alone in a walk-up apartment, up two flights of stairs. He was in the process of losing two toes to gangrene. And his closest daughter was dying of stage four breast cancer. So Fred checked all the boxes, you know, limited mobility, bad health. I asked him his favorite, the happiest time of his life, and Fred said, right now. So Fred had that attitude towards life. And Fred was a player. Fred had six kids by four women, and he always had a dirty joke and, you know, trying to sing like Billy Eckstein or talking about his flashy suits he used to wear. We went to the supermarket and he cruised the cashiers to see who was the prettiest. You know, he was just, Fred said, he'd go, I'm a bon vivant. And there's no joy like hearing Fred say bon vivant. 
and it was always a, a new joy because he always pronounced it differently. So I got a lot of fun out of going with being with Fred. But he also taught me this great lesson. He said, my favorite part of the day is waking up in the morning and saying, thank God for another day on my way to 110. Hmm. Well, gosh, if, if Fred could do that, I had to be able to do it. And we know there's a there's a tremendous science of gratitude now that just like taking that time to give thanks for something on a regular basis, people sleep better, they have better immune function, less inflammation. And it's so, so simple, right? We all have something to be grateful for all the time. And so when I started to follow Fred's lead, all the things that bothered me, all the things that were I saw that were wrong. They were all still there. But now I was forced to acknowledge all the forces alongside them that were responsible for most of the good things in my life. And they were just coming to me without me having to make them possible. And that's what I learned from Fred. And now the things that bothered me didn't look so big anymore. And some of them I just didn't have time for. So that's an example of how I was being changed by my time with these mm. these these wise people. Right. And then we'll, we can come back to more of the lessons, but let's just, you know, as you said earlier, you hope to be able to mention all six of them. So. Oh, yeah, I would hate to have anyone left out. Yeah, Ping, was, right. <laughs> Ping was 90 when I met her, living on $700 a month in Social Security. Excuse me, and she couldn't afford the pain medications, those lidocaine patches. Mm -hmm. So she'd cut them in half to make them last longer. She'd lost, Ping had lost so much. She'd lost her husband. She'd lost her only son. Her son was murdered in a department store in China. And she'd lost most of her mobility. But Ping was really clear that she did not define herself by these losses. You know, only other people defined her that way. You know, I asked her about this. You know, I said, Ping, you know, what about this? She said, I never think about the things I can't reach. I know my time is limited. So the only thing I have to do is enjoy myself, like Mahjong, because she played Mahjong every day. She said, I will do it until my last day. So Ping saw her life not as these medical problems, but as this ongoing game of Mahjong in which the medical problems were just sort of inter minor interruptions, not the main story. So it was just, it, you know, it's it's a difference in how you view your life. There's other people with those same medical problems that might be swamped by them. But Ping saw them as secondary or tertiary. And it was just that matter of seeing that way of telling her story, which changed everything. I mentioned yeah. storytelling with Jonas. Right. I think what what the elders did, and I, we we think we live our lives and we tell our story from our life, but I think what they were doing equally was telling their story and then living the, their the lives from that story. Mm. So Ping saying her life is mahjong, mm -hmm. my life is this mahjong game. Then you live that life, and that's how you see your life, mm. as opposed to saying thinking my life is these problems and I'll try to play Mahjong to get around them. Which is such a, I mean, it's such a nuanced change on that. And uh, how many times did you see them? Cause I mean, what I was thinking is the beauty of your relationships with them is you would hear what they say, but you would also see them over time. You know, how often were you visiting with these, these people? You know, there are six of them. So I was visiting each once or twice a month. Mm-hmm. And spend, you know, as much time as I could with them when I did. Mm -hmm. Plus, my mother makes seven. Right. And I saw her more often, of course. And, and I'm, the, the three men, alas, are, are all gone. But mm -hmm. the three women I'm still in touch with. I don't see them like I used mm -hmm. to, but I am still in touch with them. And it is such an honor and privilege to be able to spend time with people in this period of their lives. Because we don't do that, you know. Mm -hmm. Or if we do it, it's to solve their problems with an idea on fixing what's wrong with them or changing them in some way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a newspaper reporter, as a book writer, I didn't have to change anybody. I didn't have to fix their problems. I could just listen and I could mm -hmm. understand the value in what they were saying instead of trying to correct them. You think Fred 
loved ice cream and he loved Pringles. And if I were a caregiver or his child, I might say, you know, Fred, you've got diabetes. This is not the best thing to eat. But as a newspaper reporter, you ask the important question, which is, why Pringles? Why not Lay's? You know, and that could be a whole day's discussion. The, so, but if you're not asking why Pringles, then you're not getting at the pleasures in Fred's life. You're mm-hmm. only talking about his diabetes. And Fred was never his diabetes. He was much more his lust for Pringles. That's such an important distinction. And, and I know you make it in the book, too, about, you know, how you realize some, some of your interactions with your mother about some things she wanted or didn't want in her life and how that began to change and you could let her be her <laughs> more. Yeah, I had thought, you know, I do... My mother will often ask for help with problems, but our relationship can't be me helping her with problems. Right. That can just be like a nice sideline. And I wasn't appreciating all that I was getting from her mm-hmm. and all that she was doing for me just by the time we spent together. But mm-hmm. the time I spent with the other six whose problems I wasn't there to fix and who I didn't have to change and and who I just could accept as they were helped me understand all that I was getting from my mother and made our relationship much better. Because really, if, if as the caregiver, all you're doing is giving care one way, we can love our parents, we can love the, the people we care for and be willing to do everything for them. But each time we do something for them, we're adding, building up a little bit of debt on their part that they can't pay mm-hmm. off. Now, neither party will usually be conscious of that, and it's not it's not the foreground of the relationship, but it but it is there. It's a part of it. But if it can be more give and take, if we can understand that we, even as caregivers, are getting something out of this relationship, are getting some feedback and help the people we care for appreciate know that we appreciate. Uh, what we're getting from them, it changes the dynamic of the relationship. It definitely does. And one of the comments here um, from uh, Judy from California said she said she ordered your book from Amazon. She just finished reading it and loved it. And she said her mother's 92 and that you gave her some wonderful insights for her interactions with her. So I think other people uh, are definitely being impacted by sort of your your comments and your growth, really, and 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 the way you you do learn from and differentiate you know, the differences of when it's your mother versus these other people, and how it it really has added to your relationship with your mother. I just think that's lovely. Yeah. Oh, it did so much, and and it's yeah. and I, I get to brag about the wisdom in the book because none of it comes from me; it all comes from. Yeah. Me. <laughs> the six people I'm spending time with, yeah. and I don't mind lifting them up and, and mm. praising them for all their worth. So tell us about, so we still have John and Ruth, and then I'll integrate some of the other questions from, from other people on, who are listening. John was another story that I didn't know going yeah. in. John was a gay man mm-hmm. who lost his partner of 60 years. And John said every time we got together that he wanted to die. I thought, well, John's going to be really a depressing story to write about. That's okay. I don't mind that. But I thought it was going to be really dark. But John was such a complicated guy. And he mm. he loved to talk. And talking always got him in a good mood, including talking about wanting to die. So I would say, you know, John, you seem like you're in a good mood. Do you really wish you were dead right now? And he'd say, well, no, because we're having this conversation. And I'm like, well, no, I'm going to leave in a little while, John. You know, do you want to die then? And he'd say, well, no, because Anne is coming on Wednesday. Anne was the niece of his partner, Walter. Oh, and then Scott, my attendant, is coming on Thursday. And there's the Metropolitan Opera broadcast on Saturday. So it was interesting. John didn't want to be dead. He John would say he wanted to die, but he didn't want to be dead. It meant that he was still getting something out of this moment that he was in right now. He just didn't want to think about the decline that, mm-hmm. that he felt was coming. So to the extent that he could turn his gaze on the moment... He was really, uh, I think he probably appreciated it more than most of us because he was living fully in it. 
you know. Mm-hmm. And to the extent that he looked out in the future, again, at what isn't, he didn't want that. So John was a, a complicated case. And the last was Ruth, who taught the most complex lesson of anybody, which was, you know, we grow up in America being taught independence almost as the prime virtue, right? That's what it means to mm-hmm. to grow up and be an adult. Stand on your own feet, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And at some point or another, in the beginning of life and at the end of life, that may not work anymore. And what Ruth taught me was giving up that myth of independence or self-reliance for interdependence. And what I mean by that is she hated to accept any help from her children. If they kind of wanted to give her an arm when she was walking or help her sign checks, she did not want that because she felt diminished by it. But she also created this new role for herself in her 90s as the family matriarch. She was the last of her generation that was alive. And so she was the one who held together all branches of the family. She did something for them that nobody else in the world could do. And when she saw herself in that role, she was able to accept the help from her kids without feeling diminished by it. And it's it's a hard act to do, but if we uh, start with the idea that interdependence is stronger and more sustainable than independence, and independence mm-hmm. is this kind of fetish that gets us from adolescence into full-scale adulthood, but is it really good for the rest of our lives? Mm-hmm. It's a it's a lesson we can apply everywhere in our lives. If you know, for me as a writer, it means that. When my editors have better ways of saying things than I can, I should be grateful for that instead of saying, you're changing my stuff, which is what writers always do reflexively. When people want to give you advice on things, help you along with something, you know, don't think that they're diminishing you by it. Realize that you're stronger for their help Mm -hmm. and that you can pass that along in return. It means somebody wants to take you to lunch, you can accept that. I mean, I can't do it as a journalist, but, you know, we can accept things from other, we can accept help from other people and we can pass along help to other people. It's just a, it's just a stronger, uh, system and it lifts everybody up. You lift up the people who you let help you. It's, it's, sort of the, the simpleness of wisdom in a sense or the simpleness of just realizing just the importance of meaningful relationships of reciprocity of listening and of as you say interdependency and I, I somehow think in our country we, we forget some of these really simple life lessons oh you know what all of the lessons in my book go back thousands of years they're all in our mm. wisdom literature they've all endured for such a long time Whereas that desire to to claw your way ahead of that person at work, where does that come from? You know, like that's not in our wisdom literature. That hasn't been around for thousands of years. That need to have a McMansion or a fancy kitchen. Where did that come from? You know, that that desire to be the person with the most Facebook likes. You know, that actually has not been around for thousands of years. These it's these simple things. Gratitude, reciprocity forgiveness, apologizing to the people we've wronged, spend time with the people you care about and not the people you don't. You know, all those Mm -hmm. things have just been around for forever. And we get distracted by these other things in life. And we get steered on the wrong path. And what I found was these people over 85 who had cut out some of the, you know, who who had had to give up some other things in their lives, some Mm -hmm. willingly, some not. They didn't have the same distractions maybe, or else they just had a better focus on what was important. Mm-hmm. And that kind you know, of in the, in the book I write about, yeah. the uh, oncologist Ezekiel Emanuel, who, who's written mm-hmm. some things that are somewhat controversial and, and for good reason, but he says that at some point in their lives, every patient he ever saw said that that cancer diagnosis was the best thing that ever happened mm-hmm. to them because it mm-hmm. made them focus on what was important. And I, and I, maybe it's your, 
it's some birthday in at some part of our lives that says, okay, I'm a little closer to the end than to the beginning. It's time to focus on what's important. And let's think of that as a gift, not a not a detriment. Uh, I, we were talking about Ruth Willig before. Ruth's mm-hmm. daughter, Judy, who's a social worker, has a mentor who says she looks forward to the day when people say, you look old, and they mean it as a compliment. <laughs> and I right. think I yeah. look forward to the day when I say mm-hmm. I had a senior moment, and what I mean by that is I was about to lose my temper at somebody and then I thought better of it. I was about mm-hmm. to do something foolish, and then I thought better of it. I didn't know mm-hmm. what to do with myself, so I thought I'd call that friend I hadn't heard in a while. That's a senior moment. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's lovely, yeah. And there's a quote, I, I love this quote of John's, and it actually came up in our book group, too, because a number of people at all sort of focused in on the same quote. He was the person that uh, John was mentioning, you know, was talking about wanting to die. And he said, the only bad thing about dying, John said, is that I won't be alive long enough to enjoy the fact that I finally died. I love that. (laughs) A good sense of humor is is good in any age. Right. Right. And I and I think that what's valuable there, if I can if I can take something fun and turn it into something serious, which is like the worst thing in life to do. But I think what we learn to do throughout our lives is to put some kind of buffer between the things that happen to us and our reaction to these things. And humor is one of the ways we do that. And you know, none of us can control the things that happen to us in our lives. We're going to get we're going to have diseases are going to come our way and hardships are going to come our way and and we'll, we'll, have, we'll have challenges in our lives. And they're going to happen to us, whether we eat our quinoa or not, right? right? But we have some control over how we react to this. And I think our quality of life is in the way we react. So when John says, makes this funny joke, I think he's putting that little space, that little sense of humor mm-hmm. between what's happening to him you know, John was losing his eyesight and losing his mobility and, you know, his reaction to that. So that right. on the other side of humor, there's there's a kind of a a sense of control and a sense of glee. You said that the men in your study, um, the, the men have died. Well, Jonas is still alive, isn't he? No, Jonas oh, is alive not, at, yeah. at the end of the book, but he died in... Oh. January of this year. In fact, oh, he died on the exact anniversary of the book coming out. Oh, really? And oh. he had lived to be 96. And, and, you know, so many things are moving about Jonas. I didn't see him in the hospital before he died, but one of his friends did. And when he spoke at the memorial, he said that Jonas, the last time he went to see him in the hospital, said, I accept this. You know, he'd, mm-hmm. he'd been sort of fighting against it for a while and he said I accept this he was a Buddhist and he said I'm going to be very busy there he said Mm -hmm. because there is doing fine but here needs a lot of work (laughs) (laughs) meaning this this world needs a lot of work and he would be he would have some leverage uh, Mm -hmm. on the other side and I love that yeah wow well let me integrate a few of the questions from some of the listeners now and then we'll come back oh yeah so Jack from Minneapolis says, based on your research, what questions should people who are just leaving the workforce and quote unquote retiring ask themselves besides how do I want to spend my time? What is my purpose moving forward? What is a good, you know, what is a good place to start? And then he also said, thank you. He appreciates the work you're doing. Well, those are, those are really yeah. great questions. And I know less about those people that are just leaving the workforce. I, it's, it was sort of my my gateway drug for writing about older people, but I think what's what's valuable for us at at any age is to think about life from from the going uh, backwards from the end. Think about like we're going to live a long time. What does a great life look like in those last years? You know, who do we want to spend that time with? You know, what's important to us? What isn't? What do we hang on to? And what do we let go of? You know, pro- chances are most of us aren't going to be that person you see on the morning news who's 98. They're jumping out of airplanes and running marathons and drinking martinis. So what is a great life? What do we want that time to look like for us? And then I would say when you've done that, when you've made, drawn that life, 
that life looks pretty good. How do we do everything mm-hmm. we can to live that way right now? So, okay, I want to do this, that, and the other. And now since I'm younger, I'll add travel to it as well. Get to that. What's the important thing? What's, what's really what matters to you? And what just doesn't matter so much anymore? What can you afford to let go of? That's very sage advice. That's great. All right. So Bob from Kentucky says, he says, John, paradoxically, I've also seen mean people live a very long life and they seem content, if not an odd kind of happy, about being mean and miserable in their relationships. Have you seen this in your experiences? Can they choose to be happy by being miserable? Maybe I'm seeing through my own happy lens and projecting onto another's vision of being happy. What I have seen is some people seem to be aged and others ageless, like Betty White and Jimmy Carter and Mother Teresa, et cetera. So he says, my my key question is, when you see the unhappy, what do you do, if anything, to help them shift their thinking? Uh, I've, I think, first of all, to give up the idea of trying to change other people. I think that's, mm-hmm. that, that doesn't help them and it doesn't really help us because – what inevitably happens is they don't change. We're disappointed in, in them, and, and we sometimes can somehow construe it as they failed somehow by not changing. So now you've you've added failure on top of all their other things in life. I haven't seen people who are mean and happy. I've certainly mm-hmm. seen people who are mean and, and are able to keep it up for a long time. I think that Probably if they are happy, they're seeing their meanness as constructive and just in in some ways their own twisted version of generosity. Like, I told you that was an ugly hat as a gift to you, you know. Uh, I was offensive offensive to you and I was because I wanted to set you on the right path. Uh, That's all I can imagine if, if they are content with their lives. Where I've seen people are mean, they're hurt. And, and I think if, there's anything they could do, it would be to for, to learn to forgive the people that hurt them and to recognize that the forgiveness isn't for the benefit of the other person, but it's for yourself so you can let go of whatever it is that hurt you. Because until you forgive it, you're hanging on to that, that hurt and maybe making it stronger. So... Mm-hmm. If people are unhappy for other reasons, and it's not because they're mean, I'll, I'll often ask when the last time you did something for somebody else was, or mm-hmm. you know when you last time spent time around people who are who are shaped in you, and and if there is something you want to say to them, say you know what, I'm going to go volunteer at the soup kitchen or the phone bank for candidate X or or this or that. And it gets kind of boring. Would you mind coming along with me just to keep me company? Mm-hmm. Just to keep me company. Mm-hmm. Could, you, could you do that? It would really be a big favor to me. Don't say, why don't you volunteer there? Because it'll get you in a better mood. You know, that's that's telling people you're wanting to change them. But is there something wrong with them? Asking mm-hmm. them for this favor for yourself, I think, mm-hmm. is something that it's a little manipulative. But I think it, it gets in under the bar and is okay. Well, it's a great example, too, of of sort of modeling the interdependence. And so come come do this for me. Come do this with me <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. I need you. Lovely. You have something available. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that Susan, was a great question, though. Yeah. No, it was a really good question. And Susan from Victoria has three comments that I want to just share. Uh, first, she had said she's just touched by your awareness of the healing wisdom of just listening and how you did that and that and how it transformed your relationship with your own mother and she added then so much wisdom from these elders perennial spiritual truths and then her final comment was heartwarming acknowledgement of the gifts of late life adult development this book and john's talks can help us transform our society's views of aging and she said it's very exciting so i just wanted to share those comments with you well, there's six people modeling ways to be old, you know, like, yeah. and I think they're just, just so good at it. And uh, I think you used the word ageless before, and we use that in a very nice way. It's a very benign word, but I'm not crazy about it because I think if we think of people are ageless, we're taking away mm-hmm. some of their accomplishments, some of the, the, the capital that they've built up. Mm-hmm. Have my years had any meaning? Yes, has my getting older had meaning? So 
So being old has a value to it. And I think that's what uh, Judy Willig's mentor says when she says that that you look old today should be a compliment. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think, yes, right. you've acquired the riches of 92 years. Those riches mm-hmm. don't, if, if we thought of those riches as dollar bills, we would understand that, of course, that's a lot of riches. If we thought of them as, as time, we say, wow, you've acquired the, the riches of 92 years. Time mm-hmm. is, has this value. Wisdom has this value. Experience has this value. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, the, the organization Saging International, when people talk about their age, it's not I'm 73 years old. It's I have 73 years of life experiences. So it's sort of honoring, just as you're saying, honoring the, the life and the experiences with the age. It's perfect. That's a perfect way yeah. to put it. Yeah. I, th- I like those folks a lot. Yeah, they're, they're, it's a great organization. For those of you on the call who aren't aware of it, it's saging, S-A-G-E hyphen I-N-G dot org. I think it's dot org or try dot com if I'm wrong on that. And it's actually a free organization and it's really about developing our identity as an elder, developing our wisdom, the sage within. So I encourage people to, to, to check that out. So Annie from Concord says that she's about to facilitate a workshop on the grace of aging and her focus is going to be on releasing the hold of the ego. On the other hand, she's been a strong proponent of going for the gusto, discovering hidden parts of self, moving toward wholeness. She seems, she says it seems like another of those paradoxes. Do you see it that way or differently or how do you see it? Well, I love the letting go of the ego because the ego wants us to be exactly as we are now for the rest of our lives. And and I think Bill Thomas, who is the founder of the Greenhouse Movement, the Eden Alternative Movement, calls this the tyranny of still. And so we value people who can still do the things they once did. My ego tells me I can still play two sets of tennis or I can still walk a mile or I can still – chew my food or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever it m- might be, instead of thinking, I am this constantly changing thing. I'm not attached to the thing I am, to the to the state I'm in now, because tomorrow I'll be a slightly different state. And I won't be more or less than I was, or I'll have acquired a little bit more. But that change is not a, a diminution. I'm not losing my, myself. I'm just changing myself. But... Mm. The ego wants us to hold on to what we are right now, and I think it freezes us in time. And I think we can go for the gusto because we are accepting change, and going for the gusto means dealing with change, understanding Mm -hmm. that there's going to be some level of failure and loss and disappointment in that going for the gusto. But we've dealt with failure and disappointment before. Mm -hmm. We know how to deal with failure and disappointment. That's not going to set us back. It's that being able to kind of, it's the resilience really that you're talking about to sort of how we deal with whatever is put in front of us. I mean, it's so tied in with Eli Wiesel, you know, talking about just the, the meaning that you put on things and it's how you react to it that becomes such an important part of life. Right. That's right. Yeah. That that new bicycle doesn't make you happy. It's your reaction to the new bicycle. Right, exactly. Sense. Yeah. So Claire from New York says she's wondering if you've gotten any pushback at your speaking engagements being, quote, unrealistic, unquote, about aging, you know, when you're talking and people who are entrenched in the more negative view. And if so, how have you dealt with that? You know, I thought I would get a lot of that. And it could be that maybe the audiences that come to see me are self-selective or no one wants to be the killjoy in in a group. I don't know. But I've gotten almost none. And, in fact, the only person who pushed back at all in in over 100 talks now, one of only two people, uh, was my neighbor. Who, who pushed back against the idea of interdependence because she was 83, I think. And after a stroke, she says she cannot let anybody do other things for her. You have to try to do as many things as you can because as soon as you give things up, your life shrinks. And so I thought I have to listen to, to, uh, to Corinne and, and really take that to heart. It was a smart thing she told me and not to be 
glib about the idea of letting other people help you. But but I haven't gotten that. I'm, and I think because I'm not Pollyannish about this, uh, when I have a chance to tell the people's stories in some depth, there's real hardships there. You know, I when I talk about Fred, who's so much fun, so light, and gives mm-hmm. thanks for another day, uh, I'm also talking about Fred having this infection in his foot turning into gangrene and having two toes amputated and and living in a walk-up apartment that he can't get up those stairs without excruciating pain. And, you know, for all the dirty stories he tells, Fred's sex life is now all in his brain or, or was all in his brain by the time I, I met him. So I always try to be upfront about the level of loss and difficulty that people are going through and that it's not a matter of not that if we if we just play things right old age won't happen to us old age will happen to us physical decline will happen to us your skin is losing some of its resiliency as we speak now you're losing some muscle mass and some bone density all of those things are are cumulative and tomorrow they'll have gone a little bit further how do you want to live right now mm-hmm. and we could take you know comfort from the way hospice nurses will talk to their patients they'll say you're dying terminally ill patients so tell them you know you're dying but right now you're alive how do you mm-hmm. want to live today and mm-hmm. let's just go from there let's not look further ahead how do you want to live today that's that's so important and so lovely to hear so let me so i do want to say bob from kentucky said gave me the correct saging international website so let me just Tell people it's s a g e hyphen i n g international dot org one word saging international dot org. So I just want to share that. I know we need to wrap up in a bit, so I'm not going to take more questions. Why don't you tell people your website and how to get the book, and then maybe just some. I mean, you've been sharing such wonderful wisdom from it, but just you know, whatever some additional takeaways that you'd like everybody to to have from from your relationships with these people and what you've been learning about aging and happiness and life. Well, I hypothetically have a website and it's johnlelandauthor.com and okay. I've put it up and every so often I say I'm going to do a better job with it. But, <laughs> but somehow there's always something I'd rather do. So the, the website isn't so good. The book is available through Amazon and, and also through Audible. I didn't do the Audible mm-hmm. recording. I, we had an actor do it, and I think he does a really nice job with it. He brings things yeah. to it that I that I couldn't do. And, and as Dory said, you do get to hear the voices of most of the people in it. Uh, I was so happy that we were able to do that. I, I think the big overarching of this book, for anybody, whatever age you are listening to this, whether you're a caregiver for somebody or somebody receiving care, is that whatever hardships we have, whatever age we are, we get to say what role we give them in our lives. We can think of them as as the main part of our lives, the central focus, and everything involves around our hardships. Or we can think that our hardships are real and acknowledge them, but, but think that they are just a part of our lives. They're an element of our lives, and, and everybody has hardship. And hardship is just part of what it, experience hardship is just part of what it means to be human. It's something you share with everybody who has ever lived, not, not something that you and you alone are singled out for. It doesn't make it easy. Loss, especially. Loss is hard. Small loss, big loss, they're all hard. They knock us to our knees. But if you think back on it, the story of loss is almost always also a story of recovery and resiliency. And loss has meaning because it shows us what we're capable of. It's not just impersonal event. We learn about ourselves through loss. We learn who we are by recovering. And anyone knows this. Anyone who's experienced loss knows you come out on the other side a stronger, deeper person than you were going in. That's just a beautiful way to to end this call. And it's it's so true. And it's at whatever age we are of of dealing with loss. It just it transforms our life if we let it. 
and and if we can as you're saying focus on the gratitude and forgiveness and the resilience and really just living living the life that we have even with all its you know all the limitations yeah go ahead <laughs> i thank you and and all the listeners for giving me the chance to to speak about this stuff and giving me the chance every time i do this i'm renewing my relationship with the the people mm. three of whom i can't see anymore and mm. You know, it's always great to hear the, the the wisdom that the other people bring to these talks. Well, thank you so much for taking time and being with us today and sharing your wisdom from from all of their wisdom. And as I said at the beginning, I truly recommend this book. It's a gem, and I think that it can it's just helpful in so many different ways of being able to really live our life. Bye bye. Thanks to everybody. Bye bye. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.